please join me in Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. If you're not familiar with the Bible, um, just go to the front. It's a few books in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and then Judges. Judges chapter 6. Before we read, we're going to be introduced to another ordinary person. And I don't know about you, but I've enjoyed this series, just kind of getting to see how God works of individuals in the, in the Old Testament. I mean, it's just been fascinating. Hopefully, it's been encouraging to you. Um, let's go back to the beginning real quick before we read a story about uh, an ordinary man with extraordinary faith. God creates Adam and Eve, unique, right? Fearfully, wonderfully made. He breathes the breath of life into them. No other creature has, has been breathed in, into them the breath of life. Not only that, God says that he created them in his image, No other creature is created in the image of God. And so uh, humanity is special. We are unique. And our story begins there in the garden. And and here's the thing. God in eternity past, we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's a triune God. And he says, let us make man in our image. This is a plural God, okay? Three existing as one. And he creates mankind. And here's what he does. Pretty spectacular. He walks with them. He walks with them. In fact, some people, um, they tell me very often, they know the name of God, and his name is Andy uh, because of the song, Andy Walks With Me, Andy Talks With Me, okay? Uh, But this this is God, okay? Um, He is a God who walks with his people, desires intimacy. Turn to your neighbor and say intimacy. That's a key word. He desires intimacy. He desires fellowship. He desires oneness. You know where intimacy comes from? You ever thought about that? Intimacy comes from dependency. And so when he creates mankind, he creates us dependent on him. And as God comes and he walks with Adam and Eve in the, in the cool of the day in the garden, they are experiencing complete and total dependence on God. And it's in that dependency that they are experiencing an intimacy, a oneness with creator, a oneness with father. This was a glorious moment. Now, the very moment that Adam and Eve decide not to follow dependency and instead go into independence, okay, we're going to do things our way, they are separated from God. And so the intimacy is is lost. But listen, we serve a God, and, and God is a God who by nature desires this intimacy. So he doesn't just throw his hands up in the air like he just doesn't care, okay? Um, But he says, I have a plan to restore what is lost, to redeem what is separated, to recover the identity that was lost there in the garden. So just know this, as we read this story in Judges chapter 6, that God desires intimacy with you. In your own mind, begin to reflect on that today. God, creator, father, desires intimacy with me. That is pretty spectacular. So in Judges chapter 6, we're going to meet a hero named Gideon. I call him a hero because in uh, the New Testament, in um, Hebrews chapter 11, it is recorded uh, kind of the hall of faith. They call this the hall of faith chapter, where the heroes of the faith are listed um, based on their faith in God. And you have guys like Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and David who are listed here. Amongst them is Gideon. Gideon makes that list. Okay, and imagine if he were here today and we were to interview him and say, hey, Gideon, what, I mean, what do you think about being kind of in the, the list of guys like, like Abraham, like the father of this nation, and David, who is the, the king, a man after God's own heart? I think Gideon would say, man, I, I don't even feel worthy to be included in, in that list, but he is. He is a hero of the faith. Now, here's the thing about heroes. Heroes aren't born. You're not born. There's no special like he, uh, hero DNA, okay? And some people get it and some people don't. Heroes show up during times of great adversity. Listen, when you see great adversity or great challenge, don't shy away from that. That is the opportunity that is presented to show up for such a time as this, as we talked about last week with, with Esther, okay? So we're about to be introduced to a hero, and he's living through a situation that is doom and gloom and obstacle and challenge. Look at verse 1. The Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord handed them over 
to Midian seven years. Um, anyone ever had a bad day? <laughs> anyone ever had a bad seven years? Like that's kind of going on strong, is, is it not? But let's make sure that we understand why um, Midian is invading the land for seven years. The Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. There are some promises that God makes that are unconditional. When he tells Abraham, I'm going to make you a nation, that, that, um, that covenant or that promise is not dependent on Abraham. It's dependent on God. It's unconditional. But there are some promises that God makes that are conditional. One of the conditional promises that God makes to Israel as they're entering into the promised land is this. If you do what I say, right? if you follow my ways, if you live under my umbrella of protection, your life will be blessed and prosperous. But if you don't, warning, if you don't, if you choose to operate outside of my design for the fullness of life, you'll experience the consequences. And so Israel is reaping what they have sown. Um, They're reaping what they have sown, which is kind of the inverse here because they're planting and they're harvesting and they're not reaping anything. Why? Because the Midianites come in and steal it all. Like right at the moment of harvest, they put in the, the toil, they have put in the work. And at the time of harvest, the Midianites come and invade the land and they take everything the Israelites worked hard for. These guys are thieves, they are bullies, they are oppressors, and this is a rough moment for the Israelites. Now look at verse 11. The angel of the Lord came. All right, we're going to read a promise. I'm going to shut up, but i got to explain what this is. The angel of the Lord, or who this is. This is what we call a Christophany. This is Jesus Christ making a physical appearance in the Old Testament. So God the, the Father, right, when Moses wants to see him, um, uh, God says, you can't see my face and live. So we can't see God the Father. The, the Holy Spirit um, exists in spiritual form, but Jesus is God in the flesh. And I love talking about this because there's a lot of people who believe that Jesus, and some religions teach this, that Jesus just kind of showed up at his birth, that that was his beginning. We've already talked about it, though, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have existed in unison in eternity past, So Jesus, he has no beginning, okay? And so in the Old Testament, you often see this, the angel of the Lord appeared. Look at at your Bibles and look at that word Lord. Have you noticed how it's all caps, the L, the O, the R, the D, all capitalized? Because what that's communicating to us is this is not just a title. This is a name. This is not just the title Lord. In fact, later on, Gideon will say, my Lord, then it's a lowercase l. It's just a a title for boss or sir or, you know, manager, um, the guy in charge. But it says the angel of the Lord. It's not talking about a title here. He's talking about a name. This is the word for Messiah. This is the word for Christ. It'd be like someone saying, hey, the angel of, of Andy showed up, right? It's not some messenger sent by Andy, but it would be the that, that presence, okay, this is the angel of the Lord. The second reason we know that this is Jesus is because of the response of people to, to this angel. When a messenger shows up, when an angelic messenger shows up, the people would bow down and want to worship, and the angel would always say, hey, whoa, 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 don't worship me. I'm not God. I'm just the messenger, okay? But when the presence of Jesus showed up, when the angel of the Lord showed up, people would bow down. And Jesus wouldn't tell them not to. Or they would offer worship, and Jesus would accept it. And in Gideon, or Gideon chapter 6, Judges chapter 6, Gideon is going to make an offering to this angel of the Lord, and he accepts it. You know why? Because he's God. Only God can accept the offering. So the angel of the Lord, Jesus in the Old Testament, he came and he sat down under the oak that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the Abizrites. His son Gideon was threshing wheat in the wine press. Hold up again. He's doing what? He's threshing wheat where? In the wine press. I don't know a lot, but I know this. You don't thresh wheat in the wine press. You thresh wheat on the threshing floor. 
You'd take the wheat, you'd throw it up in the air, the chaff would blow away, the wheat would fall down, and you'd do that over and over, kind of on a hill out in the open so the wind would blow. That's the way it worked. But in the wine press, you pressed grapes. Sometimes they did that in a dark place. Sometimes they did that in a secret place. And so here, Gideon, hero of the faith, is doing what? He's hiding. He's hiding out. Now, now look, don't blame him. Don't fault him because you and I would do the same thing. We would do the same thing. But I just want you to show his, his demeanor here is reserved. He is intimidated by the Midianites. And so he is threshing wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. Then the angel of the Lord, Jesus, appeared to him and said two things. Here it is. The Lord is with you, valiant warrior. That's a strange name for Gideon, right? Is there anything that we've read so far that screams valiant warrior? Warrior? No. Kind of screams valiant wimp, doesn't it? I mean, he's hiding out, right? He's not boldly, you know, going to attack the Midianites. He has no sword. He has no shield. He's not getting the group together saying, you know what? I am sick and tired of this. We're going to go and do something about this. Why? Because I'm a valiant warrior. No, he's a wimp. And we see that just kind of played out. So the angel of the Lord tells him two things. First, he says, the Lord is with you. The second thing is valiant warrior. Notice this, two things, the Lord is with you. The second thing, valiant warrior. Gideon has a problem with one of those two things. He has some beef with that. He doesn't believe it. Which one is it? Look at verse 13. Gideon said to him, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened? Gideon has a problem with one of the two statements, and it's not the valiant warrior statement. Gideon doesn't say, hey, angel, um, listen here. Um, I am not a valiant warrior. I'll, I will confess. Don't call me a valiant warrior. I'm not deserving of that. No, no, no. He doesn't even address that. It's like it just kind of rolls off of his shoulder. Instead, what he gravitates toward, what he has a problem with is the first statement, the Lord is with you. What does Gideon say? Where? Where? Where, where? Where's the Lord? What do you mean he is with me? He goes on to say, where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about? They said, hasn't the Lord brought us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and he has handed us over to Midian. Hey, what do you mean the Lord is with me? Show me. Prove it. Where is he? Have you not read the news articles? Have you not watched Fox News? Have you not been paying attention? Where is the Lord? Have you ever felt that way? And where was God when? And every single person in the room can fill in the blank. Where was God when? And Gideon says, where is the Lord? In fact, he takes it a step further and he says, the Lord has abandoned us. The Lord has turned his back on us. Where are Gideon's eyes focused? They're focused on the circumstances, aren't they? The angel of the Lord says, the Lord is with you, valiant warrior. And immediately, Gideon begins to look around at his circumstances, and he can't see the presence of the Lord. Now, this is a really strange conversation between Gideon and Jesus Notice how the Lord responds in verse 14. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and deliver Israel from the grasp of Midian. I am sending you. Can, we, can I just say something that I think we're all thinking? Are Gideon and Jesus even on the same page here? Like, does this conversation make any sense whatsoever? The Lord shows up and says, hey, Gideon, the Lord is with you, valiant warrior. Like he's putting the spotlight on Gideon. What does Gideon do? He wants to sidestep the spotlight and say, no, 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 forget that valiant warrior part. Where's the Lord? And he turns it back on him. Prove it. Show me where the Lord is. And instead of, instead of answering the question, what does the Lord do? He sidesteps and puts it back on Gideon. Hey, um, I'm sending you to deliver Israel out of Midian. Like, I'm not sure they're on the same page. I'm not sure they're in the same book. It sounds like they're kind of in two different universes having this conversation. But as we sit with it a little bit longer, 
As we contemplate on the scripture, we think about the passage and we ask him, Lord, what are you saying here? I think some things become clear. Let's take it a little bit slower. The Lord says, Gideon, valiant warrior, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with, say it with me, you. Where is the Lord? He's with you. And Gideon is looking at his circumstances and he wants to know, where is he? He's abandoned us. And then the Lord is not sidestepping his question about where the Lord is. He's answering the question by saying, I am sending you. Gideon, you want to know where the Lord is? He's with you. The presence of the Lord. What God most desires is to be with you. And here's what he's doing. He's sending you. So if you want to know where the presence of the Lord is, he's on the way. Because Gideon, when you show up, the presence of the Lord shows up. Isn't that a powerful truth? It's kind of like, reminds me that, you know, God could snap his fingers and handle the Midianites. Like God does not need Gideon's help, does he? But how does God operate? He operates like a father. He just wants to operate and work with his children. Dad, you ever changed the car oil or mowed the lawn and you invited your son out with you? And he might grumble and complain and why do I, you know, you just want to spend time with him. You just want to spend time with your, with your daughter. Hey, I'm running some errands. Hop in the car. Let's go together. And you know it's going to take longer. You know you could do it better yourself, but it's not about the task. It's about the withness. It's about the time and the intimacy with your child. That's how God thinks about us. He doesn't need our help. One word, right? One snap of the fingers, and he takes care of the enemy. But he desires to work with Gideon. If you show up, I show up. Um, About two months ago, our family went down to southeast Texas to spend um, Christmas weekend with my folks and siblings, and we were on our way back and coming. We were on the east side of Houston, and it was early on a Saturday morning, and there was four lanes on this highway, and there was not a car for a mile in front of us, and there was not a car for a mile behind us, and we're just cruising right along. We got the music playing, and, and uh, we're just having a great conversation. Just move. We're making really good time, by the way, um, from southeast Texas back to Georgetown. Such a good time that um, I saw way in the back this car. It's like about a mile behind me, and about three seconds later, all of a sudden, that car was right on my tail. And I remember thinking, there's, you know, lanes over here and lanes over there. Just go around me, bud. But for the next couple of miles, this guy was like three feet, you know, from my bumper. And then his lights turned on. (laughs) And I thought, you know, he probably knows I'm a pastor. (laughs) And he's got an emergency and he just needs some prayer. And so... He saw me come by, and he thought, hey, that's, that's Andy Comer, and somebody uh, needs some prayer. He did not need prayer that day, and he came to the window, and, and he said, sir, can I, can I see your driver's license? And um, if, you, if you take away the hat, okay, the, the, the trooper hat, and you take away the, the uniform, and you take away the badge, and you take away the gun, what do you have? Just a normal guy named Ted. And if a normal guy named Ted asked to see my license, I'm thinking, mm, yeah, probably not. But when you take Ted and you put him in the uniform, you put him in the hat, and you put him with the badge, and you give him the gun, man, I'll give Ted whatever he needs. You got it, Ted. I'm like handing my license, you know, out the out the window, and and uh, and he was a gracious guy. But why why was I so intimidated? Because when Ted shows up, it's like the full weight and authority of the great state of Texas shows up. It's not just Ted. Right? He comes with weight. He comes with authority. And so I'm going to do what Ted says. Where is God today? When you show up, 
when you show up as a follower of Jesus Christ, indwelled by the Holy Spirit, when you show up, you show up in the full weight and authority of God Almighty. Just dream with me for a second. What would happen in our nation if the presence of God showed up? Can you just imagine? Hey, what would happen in our schools if the presence of God showed up? Can you imagine? What would happen in our homes and in our neighborhoods if the presence of God showed up? Think about this one. What would happen in our churches if the presence of God showed up? Wow. You know what we need more than anything? We need the presence of God to show up. And you know where the presence of God is? It's not some, um, what's the word I'm looking at? It's not some goosebump feeling, you know, um, necessarily in a worship service, although God shows up in our, in our gathering together. It's not the earthquake. It's not the thunder. Here's where I think we most clearly see the presence of God. The presence of God is most fully displayed when the people of God accept the mission of God in the power of God to the glory of God. I know that's a mouthful, but there's a whole lot of truth packed in that sentence. The very presence of God shows up and gets put on display when the people of God show up. And we show up not in our power or our strength, but when we show up in the power of God, for the glory of God. And we do that by accepting the mission of God. Gideon wants to do that, but his eyes are focused on his circumstances, and now his eyes are going to focus on himself. Look at verse 15. He said to him, please, Lord, how can I deliver Israel? Look at my family is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's family. See how many eyes and me's and my's he's, he's throwing out here? At first, when the presence of the Lord shows up, he puts his eyes on his circumstances. And now he puts his eyes on his inabilities, his inadequacy, his insecurity. What do I have to offer? And I love how Jesus responds. Jesus, he's so wise. He doesn't disagree with him. He says, but I'll be with you. In fact, he's agreeing with Gideon. Hey, you're right. <laughs> you are the weakest. You are the smallest. You're the scaredest. But good news, I will be with you. And listen, if nothing in our circumstances changes except he is with us, then everything has changed. Everything has changed. So we want the presence of God, then the people of God need to accept the mission of God in the power of God to the glory of God. What's the mission of God? It is to redeem a lost and broken people. That's his mission. Jesus said, that's, that's why I came, to seek and to save the lost. This is why he died on the cross. And then he turns to his disciples and he says, go. And lo, I will be with you always. His presence with us. It's powerful. The mission of God. And we, we operate in the mission of God by the power of God, not in our power, not in our strength. I love where um, uh, Judges chapter 7 goes. If you want to read this chapter later, it's pretty incredible. Gideon is going to go to battle against the Midianites, and so he puts together an army, 32,000 soldiers. Someone say 32,000. 32,000 soldiers. God looks at his army and says this, that's too many. <laughs> say what, God? Too many soldiers is like too many Oreos. It's impossible, okay? Can't have too many. Can't have too many soldiers. And God says, that's too many. I, I can't work with that. Let's whittle it down. Tell all the scared people to go home. Gideon says, if you're afraid, go home. 22,000 people go home. You know how many's left? 10,000. God says, that's still too many. And he says, hey, have them drink water. Those that drink like this, send them home. Those that drink like this, have them stay. 300 people stay. 300 people. And God says, okay, I can work with 300 people. God just passed on 31,700 soldiers. Why? So he could display his power in the situation. So that he could show off what he could do, not what Gideon could do. That's extraordinary faith. 
Not only that, we see the, the, to the glory of God in seven verse, chapter 7, verse 2, the Lord goes on to say, or else, the reason I want to whittle the army down, or else Israel might elevate themselves over me and say, my own strength saved me. Israel might elevate themselves. If you do it in your strength, you might elevate yourselves. And it's not about elevating yourself. It's about elevating King Jesus. And so we're going to do this in God's power for the glory of God. This is where the presence of God is. So if you look around in your neighborhood, in your city, in your workplace, in our state, in our nation, in our world, and you're wondering, where is the presence of the Lord? Remember this. He's saying, I am sending you. That's where it is. Now, I want to, I skipped one of the phrases, the people of God. The people of God. This is so important. It's important because we must identify as people of God. And it strikes me this week, as I get to sit with this passage for five days, that before God gives Gideon task, he gives him identity. Before Gideon gets a new assignment, he gets a new name. You know what that name is? Valiant Warrior. There's nothing about Gideon that screams valiant warrior. There's nothing about him that is displaying warrior-ness. But aren't you glad that God doesn't name us for who we are, but who we become? And God is naming Gideon, not because of who he is right here in the moment, but for who Gideon will become. This is the way God operates. God calls Abraham a prophet before he prophesies. You and I are given a new name as well. A name by our heavenly Father. Listen, he calls us by name. And if I could wrap up with this, it would be this. We need to know how God sees us. And when we understand, when we begin to get a glimpse of how creator and father sees us, whoo, things change. Can I leave you with this quote by D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody said this, the world has yet to see what God can do with a man fully consecrated to him. But by God's help, I aim to be that man. Fully consecrated, fully set apart, fully devoted to God Almighty. In our weakness, but in his power and for his glory. I just want to invite you to just bow your heads and I want you to enter into a time of prayer. We come to church and we sing songs and we hear one of the most powerful things we can do is just digest. And so ask him, God, what are you saying to me today? There's an accuser who also likes to give names. The accuser says, you're a failure. The accuser says, you're no good. You're not good enough. The accuser says, you don't have what it takes. The accuser says, you have fallen too many times. You're a failure. The accuser says, It's your fault your kids are this way. That voice is loud. That voice is real. But I believe and I have been praying that today you would hear a name for you from God. Just like he showed up to Gideon and said, valiant warrior. God wants to show up today, right now and speak life to you. Maybe you would even ask, God, what what name do you have for me? He's a father, he's a creator, he's redeemed you. What's he saying to you? Isaiah 43, verse 1 says this, The Lord 
says, the one who created you, the one who formed you, do not fear for I have redeemed you. There's this wonderful truth that we belong to God because he formed us and we belong to him because he redeemed us. It's through faith and trust in Jesus that we experience that redemption, that renewal, that recovery of what was lost. But the next thing that Isaiah says on behalf of God is so powerful. He says, I have called you by your name. You are mine. What's he calling you today? Maybe he's saying, you are strong. You are courageous. You are perfect. And our flesh wants to push back because we see all the imperfection. But the beauty of the gospel is that in our perfection and in Christ, all of that is taken away. So God sees us for what we're becoming. He says, you're my son. You are my daughter. You are equipped. I did not give you a spirit of fear or timidity. He gives us a spirit of power and love and discipline. Oh, that we could see ourselves through the eyes of our Father. God, you desire to be with us. And we long to be with you. God, speak to us today. Give us a name.